After the worship is ended, Jesus starts breaking each of the seven seals on the scroll. And with each seal that's opened, there is some kind of consequential turmoil for the earth. These painful birth pains, although increasing in frequency and intensity, are actually bringing us closer to the moment when the scroll can be opened and read, God's judgment pronounced, evil destroyed, justice administered, and goodness restored. The birth pains metaphor doesn't just tell us that bad things will happen. It tells us that there is something incredible on the other side. As you read through the opening of the seals, you will also notice that the trouble each seal brings corresponds exactly to the trouble described by Jesus on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24. All the same elements are there. False prophets, wars, natural disasters and persecution. As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings saying with a voice like thunder, Come, and I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the first seal is opened, one of the four cherubim calls forth a rider on a white horse who wears a crown and carries a bow. Don't expect a literal horseman to come out of the sky. In the same way that cherubim don't literally have four faces, and in the same way that Jesus isn't literally a lamb, these are just vivid images to help us understand the spiritual happenings behind real world events. Indeed, for everything that happens in heaven, there is a corresponding event on the earth. This image of a white horse and rider, in fact, represents false religion and false prophets. People commonly mistake it as a picture of Christ. It's easy to see why. There is a very explicit reference to Christ later in Revelation that describes him returning on a white horse. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one could understand except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, like juice flowing from a winepress. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. But while there are definite similarities between this clear reference to Christ and the first seal rider on the white horse, they're not the same. For example, the first seal rider has one crown, whereas Jesus has many crowns. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of all Lords. Also, this rider carries a bow, whereas Jesus strikes the nations with a sword. So the first seal rider looks like Christ, but he's not Christ. He's an imposter. Could he then be the Antichrist? This is probably the most common misinterpretation. However, the Antichrist doesn't make his entrance until Revelation 13, many chapters later and much further along the timeline. This rider isn't the Christ and he's not the Antichrist either. It's an image of the many false messiahs, many false prophets and the rise of false religion that precede the Antichrist. Remember John wrote, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. In other words, we know that the last days of earth are coming primarily because there will be a rise in false religion and false prophets, and these will precede the coming of the Antichrist himself. Remember when the disciples asked Jesus, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? The very first sign he talked about was, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. So the very first sign of the end will be a proliferation of false religion. This first writer represents that fact. He represents a concept rather than an individual, just as the subsequent three horsemen do. Jesus and Revelation agree on the levels of success that these many false prophets will enjoy. Revelation says that this rider will win many victories and Jesus says that these false prophets will deceive many. The fact that the rider wears a crown signifies that these antichrists will gain much prestige and honor on earth. 
a lot of people are going to be led astray. This will all increase towards the end. Now what constitutes an antichrist? The Bible tells us, anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either, but anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. An antichrist is anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ, anyone who denies that he is the Son of God, anyone who denies that he is the Messiah. Again, it's our reaction to the Son that's important. Charles Taze Russell, founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, denied the deity of Jesus and therefore he was an antichrist by the biblical definition. Sung Myung Moon, founder of the Universal Church or the Moonies, denied the deity of Jesus and therefore he was an antichrist by the biblical definition. He joins Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science, Dr. John Thomas of the Christadelphians, Herbert W. Armstrong of the Worldwide Church of God, and Charles and Myrtle Fillmore of the Unity School of Christianity, amongst many others. These are people who came in Jesus' name, but yet were deceivers. And then there are the likes of L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology, Muhammad of Islam, Buddha of Buddhism, Guru Nanak of Sikhism, and indeed founders, leaders and prophets of all religions and cults who have drawn people away from the truth about Christ. This even includes the recent proliferation of New Age leaders who have led people into the occult and Eastern mysticism. We could also put in this bracket the prophets of atheism, such as Charles Darwin, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris and Stephen Hawking. These are people who deny or even vehemently attack Christ while establishing the faith-based, man-centered philosophy of secular humanism. We can clearly see the rise of false religion in our world today through such people. The world is increasingly turning their backs on Christ and embracing occultism, Eastern mysticism, secular humanism and New Age spirituality. Don't be disheartened that these things are happening and think that God has lost control. These things must happen. When the Lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being saying, Come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. When the second seal is opened, another of the four cherubim calls forth a rider on a red horse. Again, this is just a spiritual image. Don't expect a red horse to come out of the sky. The red horse represents a pronounced increase in war all over the earth. The geopolitical situation will become increasingly unstable. According to a 2011 study conducted by Professor Mark Harrison from the University of Warwick and Nicholas Wolfe from Humboldt University, the frequency of wars between states increased at a rate of 2% each year on average between 1870 and 2001. Harrison says, the number of conflicts has been rising on a stable trend. Because of two world wars, the pattern is obviously disturbed between 1914 and 1945. But remarkably, after 1945, the frequency of wars resumed its upward course on pretty much the same path as before 1913. As the birth pains increase in frequency and intensity, we will see this trend continue. When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come, and I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay, and don't waste the olive oil and wine. When the third seal is opened, the third cherubim calls forth a rider on a black horse. This image represents economic collapse and hyperinflation which leads to famine. 
We've already seen this dynamic in action during the 2008 financial crisis. Previously comfortable families were plunged into poverty and began struggling to pay for food. For example, the Trussell Trust reported that UK food bank use rose by 170% in 2013. In the United States, Gleaners Indiana Food Bank reported that 50 million Americans, that's one in six, were experiencing food insecurity in 2012. The Bible tells us that the world's economy is going to become increasingly unstable and will suffer an even bigger collapse in the future. And this will lead to a period of still worse financial turmoil. When we consider that national debts are now so astronomical that they can never be paid back and are increasing by the second, we begin to understand that the whole world is sitting on an economic time bomb. In fact, if you go to nationaldebtclocks.org, you can watch world debt rising in real time. When this financial collapse takes hold, it will cost a whole day's wages just to buy one loaf of wheat bread. Barley will be slightly less affected, but even so, one day's wages will only buy three barley loaves. People are going to be struggling just to survive. What could upset your outlook? Are there any kind of big events, macro events, that could change the story for you in terms of where you're putting your money? Oh, sure, worldwide collapse. <laughs> you know, if Spain <laughs> suddenly goes bankrupt, Italy suddenly goes bankrupt, uh, and they might, and they well might, but I don't think it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. But eventually, Amanda, of course, the whole world's going to collapse. We in the West are, have staggering debts. The United States is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. This is going to end badly. We're all floating around on a sea of artificial liquidity right now, Amanda. This is not going to last. No, no. And when it, when it ends, the bull market and commodities will probably end too. But the bull market and a lot of stuff will end. There's an interesting nuance to this passage that's worth pointing out. It says, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's wages, but don't harm the olive oil and wine. Bread is a cheap dietary staple, however olive oil and wine represent expensive luxury items and it seems that they won't be touched by the crisis. What the Bible appears to suggest here is that the inflation and food shortages will be an issue for the middle and working class folks only, but it will have almost no impact on the rich. We saw this dynamic in the aftermath of 2008 too. While many working people lost their homes and fell into poverty in the years following the collapse, and while tax hikes squeezed the middle classes to breaking point, manufacturers and retailers of prestige brands and luxury goods actually reported increased sales figures. In other words, the super rich were continuing to spend freely. The financial crisis hadn't caused them any discomfort. This has been the way throughout all history. When there is a rising tide of financial insecurity, the yachts are lifted, but the peasants drown. What we are witnessing today and what will continue to occur in the future is a widening gap between rich and poor.